dismissed. I don't know about you guys, but every time I hear that song, it absolutely stirs my heart. It stirs my. Why do you think it stirs our hearts? Why do you think that that song stirs our hearts? Well, we want to go away. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> but I think it's because it calls to remembrance the things that we know. Can you imagine being there on that day that God created the heaven and the earth? Those days that He made all the animals and everything was just perfect. I mean, everything was just pristine, and, and God just did everything like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to think about. Have you ever thought about that? Anybody else ever think about how God just made his little animals, and the animals just, they all played together. They all, they all you know, walked around together. Everything was perfect. And uh, unfortunately, we know the rest of the story, how sin entered into the earth. And ever since then, that's why we have all these heartaches, all these disagreements, all these pains, everything that we have to go, with, go through and deal with. It's all because of sin. Today, what I want to do is I want to stir you up by your memory. Turn your Bible, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And this is something that Peter wanted to do as well. And the reason why I'm thinking about this, the reason why this came to my heart this last week, is that I'm going through, I was going through the book of Joshua. Anybody ever read the book of Joshua? You read the book of Joshua, there's a couple times, there's a couple times that Joshua reminds the children of Israel what they've been through. And if, if you look, and I, I was actually reading, I think it was either chapter 23 or chapter 24. I can't remember exactly, but I believe it was chapter 23. Joshua tells, he goes through a history of the children of Israel again. He tells them where they've been. He tells them what they've been doing. He tells them how they got to where they are. And what blows my mind, I'll be honest with you, what blew my mind, I'm thinking, God, why in the world would you put in here, in your Bible, so many times what has happened? Has anybody ever, ever else noted that, noticed that about the Bible? You can read the Bible several times, and you'll find there are a multitude of times, a multitude of times throughout the Bible where God reminds the children of Israel, you were in bondage in Egypt, and this is how I brought you out, and this is what you went through, and here's how you got to where you are. And time after time after time again, God is always reminding the children of Israel where they came from, who got them there. And what happened? You could actually probably read the Exodus story about 15 times if you read the Bible through. I don't know exactly how many times it's in there, but I can assure you it's in the Psalms. It's, it's, it's all throughout. It's in Acts. It's even in Acts. The Exodus story. Why do you think that is? It's because we are a forgetful people. Amen? We are a forgetful people. Me and Brother Gordon were talking about our forgetfulness this morning. Do you remember that? I can, I can barely remember that. We were talking about it. <laughs> But we, we were talking about our forgetfulness. If you tell me one thing and something else comes to my mind, man, so I, I'm, I'm on that thing. I'm a one-track mind guy. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what's got to get done. Okay, tracks change. Now I, I forget everything else, and I go on to the next thing. Anybody else like that? Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad I'm not alone. We are forgetful people, and it's easy for us when we get caught up in a, in a, in a sinful situation or in a situation that's bad that we kind of forget that God's watching us. God's with us. God's there. Just like the children of Israel did. And we can sit here and say, oh, those stinking children of Israel, they were so bad. How could they not remember what they had just gone through? How could they forget that they were, were prisoners in Egypt? How could they forget that they were slaves? Ladies and gentlemen, we forget the same thing every single day just about. When you go to commit that sin, when you go to willfully do something against God, His purpose and His will for your life, Ladies and gentlemen, you have forgotten who you are. You've forgotten where you come from. You've forgotten what God has delivered you from, that you don't have to be in that situation anymore. It's not for you anymore. You've forgotten who you are. And so with Peter, in his last book, the last letter that he writes, he wants everybody to re be reminded. He wants to remind us. So turn your Bibles, 2 Peter chapter 1. Look what the Bible says. We're going to start out in verse 12. We're going to go through the whole chapter. But we're going to start out in verse uh, 12, and we'll read through the rest of that. When you get there, say hallelujah. hallelujah. The Bible says this, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Peter said, hey, I, don't, I, I, I am not going to be negligent to put you in remembrance. I want you to always, always, always be reminded. You need to always be reminded, even though you know them. You ever, have, you ever have somebody tell you something and you already knew it? What's your reaction? Yeah, 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 I know. I know. 
I know, I know. Put those donuts in that bag. I know. Fold it over twice. I know. Pack it tight. I know. <laughs> was that like, was that, that's like yesterday, right? <laughs> Pack those donuts tight. I know. Right? That's how we are. We, we, sometimes we need to be reminded. And Peter said, I'm not going to stop reminding you. I don't want to stop reminding you. You've got to be reminded constantly. He would be negligent if he didn't remind them. Verse 13, yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, in other words, as long as I'm alive, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Let me ask you a question, and be honest, okay? Be honest with me, I'll be honest with you. When I heard that song, even the first time, that stirred me up. Did anybody else get stirred up? To, re- to be reminded of what was done for us, what, what situation we had to go through, to know that, we, uh, that man had destroyed God's perfect creation, and yet God still redeemed us back. God still bought us back through the blood of Jesus Christ. Does that not stir anybody else up? I mean, we get excited about the basketball games, the football games. I don't know about you guys, but to know that I'm on my way to heaven, my heart just stirs, man. My heart just gets going excited. I just, it's, it's awesome. It's indescribable how it feels. There's no words for it. To know that I was a lost, dead sinner, and Jesus still loved me. How could you want to forget that? How could you want to turn away from that? I can't understand. And Peter said, I want you to always remember. And this should stir you up. This is something that should get you excited. This is something that should stir your heart in a, in a number of different ways. I don't know, man. I'm excited and I'm, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sad at the same time because I know Jesus had to die for me. But I'm excited. And there's all kinds of different emotions that, that are stirring up. I don't know about you guys. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm talking like a woman now. Is that, is that what's happening? Was that sexist? Am I allowed to say that? Oh, sorry. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> ladies like are a resounding yes, very much so. Sorry. I get stirred up, man. I get excited. Being a Christian is something to be excited about, church. Right? I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how long you've uh, been baptized. I don't care how long you've been saved. It's something to be excited about. It's something we ought to be stirred up. And sometimes our memories have to be stirred up. So, verse 14. Knowing that surely I must put off my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Oh, that's awesome, isn't it? He's saying this isn't some fake thing. This isn't some religious scheme. This isn't some religion that somebody uh, decided to think up one day. This is real stuff. And as a matter of fact, I would go as far as to say heaven is more real than this place here that we, that we call real right now. You see, right here, on, right now, this stuff, all that we see is, is, is temporal. You know, we, the things that we get upset about, the things that we are, are unhappy about, the, the, the fact that the pews are still orange. Hey, gummit. That's upsetting. Sorry. I could be upset about that. I could choose to be upset and be mad about that. Oh, this is terrible. I can't believe the pews are still orange. This is terrible. This stuff's not going to matter. And very soon, all this stuff is going to be burnt up. All these, all these things that we get so worried about, this money, this, all this stuff that, that, that we are so concerned about is going to be gone. And what will be real is the things up in heaven, the eternal things. So you could almost say this stuff really isn't even real. In a sense, what's real is what lasts forever. You understand what I'm saying? Peter said, hey, this is not just some fable. This is not a religion. This is not anything like that. This is the true, actual relationship that we have eyewitnessed our own selves. We've seen this. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were... With him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day star, day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What's the more sure word of prophecy? What's more sure than Peter's eyewitness account of the transfiguration? You know what Peter is saying right here? Let me tell you what Peter is saying. Peter said, hey, don't take my word for it. If you don't believe me that Jesus Christ was transfigured, if you don't believe that the, that the voice came down from heaven, that's fine. That's cool. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. 
And what's that more sure word of prophecy, ladies and gentlemen? You hold it in your hands. You're reading it up on these screens right now. That's the more sure word of prophecy. The Holy Bible. Everything that God said in the Old Testament has come true in the New Testament. Everything that God said He was going to do, God has already done. And He's going to do here in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a more sure word of prophecy. So if you don't believe Peter, believe God's word. Jesus is who He said He was. That's pretty awesome. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man... But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, this is God's word, ladies and gentlemen. This is what's real. I want to stir you up today. You ought to get stirred up. Wouldn't you you be stirred up if you found out that you really want a million dollars tomorrow? Would you be stirred up a little bit? Some of you probably would be a little stirred up. Some of you might even get excited. Some of you might even say something about it to somebody else. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You'd probably keep it from the preacher because he'd probably expect a, a, a nice, generous donation, right? That's the one person you probably wouldn't want to tell besides the IRS. <laughs> Amen? But I imagine that most of your friends, most of your relatives would find out pretty quickly that you had just won a million dollars. Woo! This is real. I'm looking at it right here. I know it. This is awesome. It's not some, uh, some rumor. It's not, a, it's not an email from Nigeria. It's a real thing. I really want a million dollars. You would be stirred up. You would be excited. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a home in heaven. You have eternal life with Jesus Christ where people walk on gold and worship God. Do you understand how much more valuable that is? And yet we can't get excited about that. We can't be stirred up about that. I have a problem with that. Amen? We should be excited. We get excited about all kinds of other stuff. We need to be stirred up about God and His Word. Let's go, to the, let's go to the Lord right now in prayer, and then we'll, we'll get right to the message, okay? Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the day. Thank you, God, for your grace, your mercy, your kindness, everything you do for us. Please bless this, your Word, today. Bless this message, God. Touch our hearts, Lord. Don't let us just walk out of here the same way we came in. Father, I pray that those who are Christians in here, those who are truly saved and know they're on their way to heaven, I pray you wake them up. Wake all of us up. Let us understand what it is we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray today that those of us who are saved would, would be stirred up to tell everybody about the wonderful grace you've given us. And if there's one here who's never trusted in Jesus Christ, Lord, more importantly, help them to be saved. Lord, help them to see that they can have true salvation, Lord. Not just some hope, I think so, maybe so, but a real I know that if I died today, I would be with Jesus Christ. Let today be the day of salvation. We beg these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, real quick, I've got to tell you, um, this is a little bit of a longer message. So if you, if you need to leave, I understand. That's completely understandable. But I, mean, I, I promise you I will get done as soon as I get done. Are you okay with that? You cool with that? All right, good deal. So if you need to leave, that's cool. I understand. I won't be offended at all. I won't even send Brother Scott after you to give you the bonnet cover from the top rope. I promise. All right? But I do need to, I need to say a couple things. So, first thing I want you to see about being stirred up is you have to have a personal testimony. You understand that? You have to have a personal... If you, if you don't have anything to be excited about, why would you be stirred up? <laughs> have you ever been excited about nothing? Hey, I, why are you excited? Oh, I don't know. I'm just excited. <laughs> have you ever been that way? I can't... I, I'm not... I haven't been. If I get excited, I, I just had a monster. That's why I'm excited, you know, kind of thing. I, I, there's, there's always a reason. There's something going on, and there's always a reason why people all ha, are, have excitement, right? You got to have something to show for it. Peter talks about his personal te- your personal testimony. In verse 12 and 13, he lets them know, I, I, I'm not going to let you. I'm, he said, I, I tell him, give me a second. I didn't even have any coffee today. I'm okay. It says, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. In other words, you already know about salvation. You already know about Jesus Christ. You know what he's done in your life. You have a personal testimony, okay? And I want, you, I want to put you in remembrance of the thing you remember. How can you remember something you never did? Remember that time, Brother Paul, we went to the Bahamas together? No, you don't remember that. Why? Because it didn't happen, amen? That's why, never, that's why you don't remember it. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of people who are trying to be like Christians and they're trying to remember a salvation experience, but the fact of the matter is, it never really happened. 
You ask them about their salvation, they say, well, I was a good person, I didn't kill anybody, I, let, I helped people across the road, I did all this kind of stuff, but, I, but you can't, when it talks about being saved and knowing for sure that they're on their way to heaven and what they've done with Jesus Christ, they kind of have the, the crickets chirping, right? They don't know because it's never happened. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have some, to get excited, you must first have a personal testimony of the things God has done for you. And you can find that. Look at verse 1. The Bible talks about what we can obtain in verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant of an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them who have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You can obtain like precious faith. What do you mean by that? What I'm saying is you can be saved. Did you know that? Salvation is not limited to, oh boy, it's not limited to Jews. The Jews thought that for a little while. Did you know that? There are many Jews, if you look at the book of Acts, there are many Jews who thought, you, in order for you to be saved, you have to do what we do. And you have to be like us. You have to be Jews. No, that's not the case. It's not even, it's not even for just southern white people. Can you believe that? Yeah. There are a lot of southern white people that don't feel like salvation is for anybody else but them. And there's all kinds of groups that think that salvation is only for them and salvation is only for these people. No, listen, I want you to understand, Jesus died for the whole world, every single person. They are all lost. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is a like faith that you can obtain. You can have. It's for you. God has given it to you so that you might have it. He wants you to have it more than you want it. Isn't that awesome? Can you imagine if the government wanted you to have your tax refund more than you wanted it? <laughs> they hold that check pretty quick <laughs> for a long time, don't they? That's something you can obtain. Now listen to how it pertains to you. Verse, 13, verse 3, the Bible says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through him, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. In other words, God has not only given you salvation... But God's given you everything else that pertains to life. Did you know that when you get saved, that's not the end of your Christian life? That's not the end of your story? There's more to it? Jesus said, I've come to give you life. And he could have stopped right there. But he didn't. He said, I've come to give you life, but I've also come to give you life more abundantly. And how many of us Christians are living that more abundant life today? And I'm not talking about your Joyce Meyer kind of thing where you have the gold toilet seats and, you know, ro rolling out in rolls. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the abundant life that comes from having love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying? That's the kind of abundant life God wants to give us. I'm not talking about the big mansions on the hill and the big car over here. I'm talking about having that love, joy, and peace that the world has no idea what they're missing out on. How many of us have that? Most of us walk around like uh, we just ate a bunch of lemons. Woe is me. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat worms and die. Is that the way Christians ought to live? Man, there's no sense in it. Why do that? If God's given us something that pertains to all life and godliness and knowledge of him. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to walk around miserable. God's given you everything you need for this life. Woo, that's good stuff. But what, you also need to see what you can retain. The Bible says, Whereby we are given unto, this, ex, unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, you retain this thing. This is not something that goes away, Brother Matt. It's not something that just, you, well, okay, I'm saved, I'm happy today, and tomorrow I'll be miserable and sad. To, and, 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 and not only that, but i got to get saved again tomorrow because I have a bad thought. I have, I have a bad thought. Brother Paul did me wrong. I hate his guts now, so I have a bad thought. i got to get saved tomorrow again. That's not what happens. You retain salvation. And guess what? You retain all those other good things, that love, joy, and peace that God gives you. And the more you build upon it, the more you retain it, the more, they, the more it stays with you. All right, am I getting through to anybody? Are you all with me? This is, to me, this is exciting stuff. You all look like you're falling asleep. No more Saturday Night Live, Miss Sandra. She's awake. She's awake. She's awake. We've got we to gotta retain it. Verse 10, look what the Bible says here. Verse 10, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure... 
For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. That's not talking about falling away from salvation, dear friend. That's talking about falling on your face in the midst of this world. That's talking about staying true, staying strong, being a good Christian. You don't lose your salvation. I want you to understand that you do not lose your salvation. But you can lose your joy. David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he didn't say, God, oh, save me again. You know what he said? He said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, Psalm 51. He didn't say, save me again. I'm lost. I need to be saved. He said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I lost it. I lost the joy. I didn't lose the salvation. So that's what you can retain. But then Peter also tells us how we can maintain. Look what verse uh, 5 through 8 says. It says, and beside this, giving all diligence to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's good stuff to be had as a Christian. I remember when I first got saved, started coming to church i didn't want to go you know why you want to know why i didn't want to go i was like 13 14 years old i can't remember exactly how old i was but i didn't want to go and, and the reason why i didn't want to go is because i heard that man if you be if you become a christian you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't go here and you can't say that and you can't you can't 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 right anybody else ever hear those things Christianity at that point for in my life was just a, a list of negative rules. You can't do this. You can't go here. You can't go there. You can't go there. Let me tell you something, man. When, I, when Jesus found me, I don't know about you guys, but man, I've had an abundant life. God has given me joy and love and peace. And even through those hard times when most people would not be able to get through those things, I've, I've had an opportunity to, to grow and flourish and do great, greater things. And God has done greater things through me than I ever thought possible. As a matter of fact, he does greater things through me when I'm, the, when I'm not in the way. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? When I'm, when I'm not high-headed and cocky, God does great things through me. It's amazing. And I'm sure you have the same testimony yourself. What God has allowed you to add and maintain in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, we have something to be excited about. We don't have to walk around as those who have no hope. We don't have to walk around sad and depressed and lonely all the time. We've got Jesus Christ in our corner. He's on our side. And he's with us. And he's given us a church to come grow together and love each other and help each other through those things. Isn't that awesome? And he gives us a way to maintain our life in in him. You know what the problem is? Most of us just don't want to do it. So we have to have a personal testimony. Number two, you also see Peter's testimony. Peter is stirring us up by showing our own testimony, and then he shows us his own testimony in verse 14 through 18. He talks about how that God revealed himself to him. He talks about how Jesus told him what was going to happen in his life. Jesus told Peter his destiny. Y'all remember that story about in John chapter 20 when Peter and uh, James and John are all in the boat and they're going fishing? Remember that story? Peter, James, John going fishing. They said, Peter said, I'm going fishing. I'm out of here. I'm tired of this junk. I'm be a Christian anymore. I'm going fishing. So he goes fishing, and he takes Peter, James, and John with him, and a couple other guys, and they go out there fishing. They ain't caught nothing all night. Jesus comes down on the shore. Jesus said, hey, children, have you caught any meat? They said, nope, we ain't got nothing. They said, throw up on the other side. They throw on the other side, and so many fish, they pick them up. Remember that? And Peter, as soon as he sees that, he, uh, he jumps out into the water, and he climbs, and he swims to the shore, and everybody else kind of follows him with the fish. Jesus already got fish there. I don't know why they brought the fish. That's kind of weird, but Peter gets over to the shore. And during that time, you know what Jesus tells Peter? He says, Peter, I'm going to use you. But eventually, you're going to die just like me. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? That's pretty sobering to think, okay, I'm going to die just like you? Peter remembers exactly what they did to him. Peter remembers the beating. Peter Peter remembers the stripes. Peter remembers him being nailed to a cross. Peter remembers all those things. Even still, Peter understands that the glory in heaven is much better than any pain here on earth. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus told him his destiny. Jesus let him know what was going to happen. And that's 
awesome thing about God. God tells you, hey, there will be trouble in your life. Hey, there will be problems in your life. Not everything's going to be honky-dory. Not everything's going to be a bowl of cherries. It's not all going to be good. You know what the devil tells you? Oh, just come on down here. Everything's going to be fine. Do it. It's going to be good. It's going to be fine. You're going to have a great time. Everything's going to be great. They don't show you the after market. They don't show you the after picture. They don't show you after you've been drinking all night and having a great time how that you get into a car accident and die or somebody else. They don't show you that. Jesus shows you the whole picture. He says, hey, there's going to be problems in your life. There are going to be times you're going to need me. There are going to be times you're going to be on your face before me. And those are the times I'm going to use you the most. Jesus told Peter his destiny. Not only that, Peter also saw the transfiguration. Verse 17 and 18, he says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, that he said that twice. God said that twice. He said that first time when Jesus got baptized, and the second time when Jesus was transfigured. Right? And Peter is talking about the time he's transfigured. And we know that because verse 18 says, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Peter says, I saw it. I was there. I watched it. I watched Jesus in his glorified body. All those things that we, we thought Messiah was going to be, you know, the king just come in and kind of take things over. We thought Messiah was just going to kind of uh, rule this, this old world. Hey, that's not what Messiah was about. Messiah is about something far, far greater. It's not about this world, dear friend. And unfortunately, we as Christians get so caught up and, 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 and bogged down in this stinking world that we can't see what God's trying to do through us spiritually. We see a problem, we say, oh, this is terrible, a physical problem, we, and we get upset and we get all mad, and we don't see the great things God's doing through us spiritually. We go through a, a tough time in our life, and God uses that tough time to strengthen us and help us get stronger and be something for somebody else, and we can't see the blessing in that. Do you know what I'm talking about? You ever been there? You're sitting there saying, God, why are you doing this to me? God, why are you doing this to me? Some up to you and they need the very same thing you're going through and you help them oh i see i see god's revealing things and doing things in such a way that we can't possibly know all the great things god's got for us but we can know through peter's testimony that there is greater than what we see only three men got to see jesus in his glorified body on that day peter james and john Everybody else just kind of had to take their word for it. <laughs> but what a word it was. What a word it was. So Peter's testimony, we, have a, we, we see our own personal testimony, what God's done in our life. Peter's testimony, what God did in his life. But there's also the prophet's testimony, verse 19 and 21. 19 through 21. The Bible tells us that we have a more sure word of prophecy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I want to tell you something. I know this is going to come as a shock to you. And you are going to be absolutely floored. Your mind is going to be blown but just hear me out. I am not infallible. The mask is off. <laughs> you heard it here first. I'm not infallible. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I know you guys did not believe that. You guys are just astounded right now, aren't you? God, God is just blown away. He is out of his socks right now. I'm not. And so you know what? There are going to be times that I may... A mess up on something. There are going to be times that my testimony might not be 100% true. You know, I've always said this, there are three sides to every story, right? Your side, my side, and what really happened. Yeah? And guess what? That's the same situation in everybody's life. They say that you can take five blind men and put them next to an elephant, and you'll have seven different creatures that come out of that story. Because they don't know. I mean, and that's kind of the way we are. Sometimes our testimony isn't 100% accurate sometimes we may mess up some things sometimes there are some there are sometimes where great spiritual leaders will fall and we know we know about that don't we 